I think intelligence is probably the right place to start because as you mentioned, it's uh, so heritable and there's been so much research on it and it is so replicable. So maybe we should start with, well, I don't know how you like to talk. Do you like, do you think a historical approach is good? Are the results that were collected beginning in the 1920s still viewed today as reliable or do you prefer to talk about the more recent research? But I guess the question is, what has been found about the heritability of intelligence? Yes, good. Well, some of the first studies in behavioral genetics in the 1920s, the first twin study in 1924, and the first adoption study in 1928 were on IQ, because it had just been invented at the time. Um, Spearman, Charles Spearman in 1904, first talked about um, what he called G, general cognitive ability. He noticed that all different tests of cognitive ability, memory tests, spatial tests, verbal tests, even vocabulary, they all correlate. They have this positive manifold. And so he developed factor analysis as a way of extracting what's in common among these diverse cognitive tests. And that's what he called G general cognitive ability. And I mention that because, you know, there's still the sense, oh, intelligence is just what intelligence test measures. But it's actually one of the best studied traits that we have. It's solid. Hello. <laughs> and very... Um, My co-host. Yep. Very reliable. And it predicts more things that we value in society than anything else. So it is important. It's like, it's like, People say, oh, but what is it? Well, what it is, is what diverse tests have in common. But you can think of it like a key factor is abstract reasoning. Or I mentioned this in case some people still have hangups about intelligence. Um, if, if we sat down with some friends and just said, well, what do you think an intelligent person is? We would come up with a test. We could come up with a test that would correlate quite highly with other intelligence tests. It isn't this magical, weird construct. You know, it's just you'd expect an intelligent person to be able to solve problems, new problems, you know, problems they haven't dealt with before. And so abstract reasoning is part of it. And you probably recognize that um, verbal ability is part of it too. You know, you'd expect an intelligent person to be able to explain something to you in a way you understand. You know, so, um, so uh, I guess if they, I, I just am concerned that sometimes people just kind of dismiss intelligence. And so maybe that's enough to get people to say, well, okay, don't just dismiss this. It's just like general learning ability. And surely you saw teachers see that some kids learn a lot more quickly than other kids. And it isn't just one thing. Some kids just generally pick up stuff a lot quicker than other kids. So that's sort of what we're talking about. And because it's obviously related to things that we value in society, like occupational status and income, it's been studied for a hundred and years in psychology. And the first twin and adoption studies were on intelligence. And they suggested, I think it's quite amazing to go back to those studies and say, they came up with heritability estimates that are quite, they didn't have the statistical sophistication we have now, but their data is quite compatible with current data. And this is the most studied trait in um, behavioral genetics, general cognitive ability. And it suggests that on average, 50% of the differences between people in intelligence tests, no matter how you measure it, you know, um, there's something called the indifference of the indicator, because it is what cognitive tests have in common any set of cognitive tests gives you pretty similar results. And it isn't that some things are more heritable than others. You know, you might be surprised that um, spatial ability, verbal ability are just as heritable as other traits. The only one, memory is very difficult to measure and it shows less heritability. It may be because it's just less reliable to measure. If you've taken like an intelligence test, like the Wexler test, one of them is digit span. And they give you digits, you know, one, seven, nine, three, and then you have to say them backwards. And, and they keep getting longer and longer. And you start feeling your brain frying. And, and, you know, it's very easy to say, 
I can't be asked to do this, you know, because it takes a lot of brain energy to do that. Whereas other tests like uh, vocabulary, vocabulary is one of the most highly heritable tests, which is kind of interesting in light of what we were saying before, because people say, how can vocabulary be heritable? But remember, we're talking about individual differences. Some people have a very big vocabulary and they're verbally very fluent and other people are less so. And I, I have a grandchild, I have six grandchildren. One of them, a girl is very keen on language and she always wants to know, why did you use that word rather than that word? Interested in the nuances of words. And these other grandchildren, you know, whatever, you know what I mean, you know, and who's gonna get the better vocabulary? You know, it's not like you sit down and memorize words, you pick them up. And some people are more oriented towards a verbal channel. It isn't like the words are hardwired in your brain, obviously. So it's a good example of what we were talking about um, earlier. And so my point is that all cognitive tests show substantial genetic influence and G, general cognitive ability, is what they have in common. And so um, it's the best study trait. All the data suggest a heritability of about 50%, but there are some spe special findings that are, I think, particularly interesting. And that is that if you if you, if you if you ask if we ask the listeners to think about intelligence general learning ability would you think that genetic influence becomes less important or more important as you get older That was exactly the next question that I was going to ask you because as I was reading I found it very counterintuitive just based on what I think of heritability to say that, and I'll, I'll answer your question because I read that heritability of intelligence increases during development. And I don't really know what that means. Yeah. Well, that's, that's really a cool finding because the problem in psychology is a lot of our findings, you know, you get the old thing, well, my grandmother could have told me that. But this is one where if you ask a public, you give a public lecture and you ask people that question, they would say, just like you did, that you'd expect that the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, environment, accidents, environmental things add up as you go through life, whereas your genetics is a constant. So you'd expect that genetic influence goes down during the lifespan. But instead, the heritability of intelligence goes up dramatically from infancy to childhood, to adolescence, to adulthood, to older adulthood. It goes up, goes from 20% in infancy and early childhood to 40% in adolescence, to 60% of the variance in middle adulthood. And some people say, excluding dementia, 80% later in life. But that is a dramatic increase. I mean, from 20% to say 60% or 80%, it, it's just a monster finding. And so the next question always is, but why would that be? Well, can we, before you say why that, before you answer why that would be, I don't know the right way of framing this question, but can you sort of make up a, a case or an example to explain what this means to say, to say that it, the heritability increases as we age? So, yeah. 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 Okay, good. Well, you can take twin studies or adoption studies. So you can take all those twin studies in that meta analysis I described and as, as we've done, take, separate them by age. So they're not all longitudinal studies, but you know, you can take those with infants, those with middle childhood, those with adolescence, and you get exactly this linear increase in heritability. So the older twin studies, you know, the adults will show 60% heritability, identical twin correlations of say 0.8 and fraternal twin correlations of say 0.5 in adulthood. And so heritability increases linearly, just the same adoption, the twin method. And then in adoption, our adoption study, the Colorado adoption study, studied kids from infancy through adolescence. And what we know is parent offspring resemblance, where you share genes and environment, non-adoptive families, it goes up from say 0.2 correlations to 0.4 correlations from infancy to childhood. And what you find is the birth parents also show that same increasing similarity in IQ to their adopted away children. So it's the same, it's just exactly the methods I described of analyzing, estimating heritability, but you just do it across age and you find that these heritability estimates consistently go up. 
Can I? Uh, so I cut you off early, uh, just a few minutes ago, but you were going to explain why we find that the heritability increases. And I'm wondering if I, I can just, I don't know the answer, but I'm going to guess. And is it that one of the things genetics does is determine how we interact with or determine might be too strong but it heavily influences how we interact with the environment and how the environment interacts with us and it would just stand to reason then that the longer time period we have to interact with the environment the more time it gives for our genes to manifest themselves so going back to your example of your granddaughter, we know that she has this aptitude for language. But when she's an infant, she hasn't had that much time. Well, one, she doesn't speak yet if she's just six months old. But by the time she's two, she hasn't had that much time to interact with the environment. But by the time she's 10, she's doing, she's learning how to read. She's starting to engage with books. By the time she's 25, she will have already gone to college, have have an English degree. And as she gets older, it's just more and more time for her to soak up words. Is that basically how this yeah, works? Exactly right. In genetics, we call that gene environment correlation. And it's the idea that, um, you know, environmentalism has this view that the environment's out there imposed on us. And that comes from animal studies, where as the experimenter, you decide to starve or shock the rats to make them learn certain things you want them to learn. And a lot of us still have this feeling the environment is out there, imposed passively on us. But what genetics says is that, say, there's strong genetic influence on vocabulary. As I say, it's one of the most heritable cognitive abilities. Yet you're not born with vocabulary words, as you're pointing out. You have to learn vocabulary words. But you don't learn them by sitting there memorizing a dictionary. You pick them up in your environment. And so the idea is that the genetics doesn't work by hardwiring your brain for vocabulary. Instead, it gives you, it u- makes you use your environment to foster your genetic propensity. So that I often say you, you um, select environments, modify environments, and create environments correlated with your genetic propensities. So you hang out with other kids. You have a spouse who you can talk to in the morning, you know, you select environments that are correlated increasingly as you develop. So there's another type of, well, I won't go into that, but uh, no, but exactly right. I really agree with you. And, but the more general point of gene environment correlation is we actually create our environments. We select them, you know, by going to university, maybe by going into English or by reading, you know, you, you just like to read because you like words and the and language. So I think that that's getting us into this interface between nature and nurture, which is a very important topic.